Good evening, everyone. I am Donna Ieen Davis, Director of the Center for the Study of Women in Society at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. And I'm delighted that you all are here joining us this evening for um, one of the last events that the center is uh, presenting. Be sure to follow us uh, and come to our future events. Tonight's event is being co-sponsored <clears throat> with the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, the Center for the Humanities, the Graduate Center PhD Program in Anthropology, the Feminist Press, the Graduate Center Library, the Publics Lab, and Public Programming. And of course, I want to thank the wonderful staff at the Center, Eileen Liang and Jennifer Bay, and I want to thank the people who work with us from the Public Programs Department, Jimmy Koch, Tim Ellis, and Karen Sander. Please note that this event is being recorded. And at the end of the uh, conversation that uh, Mary Gray and I will have, we will take audience questions. Um, and please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A box. And I would also appreciate it if you would um, maybe spell your name phonetically if you're interested in having your name announced. I am so excited to welcome Mary L. Gray. Mary Gray is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research and faculty associate at Harvard University's um, Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. She maintains a faculty position in the Luddy School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering with affiliations in anthropology and gender studies at Indiana University. Mary is an anthropologist and a media scholar by training and focuses on how people's everyday uses of technologies transform labor, identity, and human rights. She sits on several boards, including Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research and the California Governor's Council of Economic Advisors, in addition to chairing the Microsoft um, Research Ethics Review Program, which is the only federally registered institutional review board of its kind in the tech industry. In 2020, Mary was named a MacArthur Fellow for her contributions to anthropology and the study of technology, digital economies, and society. And while all of these are amazing achievements, I have taken up a mantle started by my friend, Samina Mullah, who always shares the words of others when she introduces someone. And I want you to know, Mary, how much you are respected and admired. Just today, I was speaking with Professor Lorian Bowles at Davidson College, uh, telling her about your talk tonight. And she said, oh my God, when I taught in Illinois, um, where for many students, even going to college was transgressive, reading out in the country, which was Mary's first book, youth media and queer visibility in rural America gave them a lifeline for figuring out how to be in the world and a way to think about anthropology having value. And then our dear friend, Krista Craven had this to say, Mary is fabulous in so many ways. See, she is a sharp and incisive scholar, a beautiful writer, and a fantastic organizer. Short story, she gets stuff done and motivates others to do the same. It's been wonderful knowing you all of these years, and thank you, Mary, for being an inspiration, a friend, and a colleague. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Mary Gray, whose discussion tonight Ghost Work in Pandemic Times is from her recently co-authored book, Ghost Work, How to Stop Silicon Valley from Building a New Global Underclass. Thank you and welcome Mary Gray. Thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all and uh, I'm gonna do my best to just offer some uh, introductory um, comments and, and framing of this argument, because I, I think one of the things I've learned along the way is that um, I should never take for granted how opaque uh, any of these systems are. So I want to spend a tiny bit of time just explaining what exactly do my co-author Siddharth Suri and I mean by ghost work 
And um, to give you a, a, a way of thinking about a way of work that is meant to be a proxy for a, a different way of thinking about how we value and devalue labor. So let me begin with a little bit of definition work. Um, we're not talking about niche jobs. And often at the beginning of this research project, um, many of the people we encountered assumed we were just talking about people who do what's called data labeling. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. But the idea was that perhaps we were just looking at um, task work that would be easily automated away. We're actually looking at the reorganization, and I would argue the dismantlement of full-time employment itself through technologies like artificial intelligence, but not just strictly focused on replacing human labor, more, at least in this moment, quickly making work of uh, the workplace itself. And I, I don't think I'm um, speaking to folks who now can't relate to the experience of working from home, but so much of technology is focused on being able to facilitate picking up and doing work from wherever you might be. And, and that is the lens I want you to, to share with me as I'm talking about the research that we did. By looking at this reorganization, this dismantlement of employment, of the, the, the way we think about what constitutes work and work sites, we're arguing that it's the labor conditions that come to be devalued whenever there is a motivation to hide the contributions and in many ways to dismiss the contributions of the workers who at the end of the day are necessary to provide a product or service in, in this environment, but more broadly in, in what you might think of as information care work. So I've thrown a lot of terms at you and I, I, I wanna give you a picture of what exactly is going on when we're talking about the task-based work that, that I'm describing. How is it that chasing automation, trying to, to create ways in which um, robots or algorithms take over people's jobs might be dismantling employment, but also creating work at the same time? How is this possible? Well, it's an interesting thing that it's only about 15 years old, the ability for businesses with tasks that demand attention. So any of the economists in the, in the audience think about supply and demand, that the demand is driven by people who have tasks that need to be done. And there was this innovation in being able to create websites. When I say platform, just think website. Um, but, but certainly websites that have sophisticated software in them that allow anyone with a specific task to be done that can be written down as a request can be placed on this website, placed as a task, as a request to be done. And the internet is effectively, in addition to this, this little sprinkle of algorithms and what are called application programming interfaces, again, more software is thrown into this mix so that anybody on the other side of the screen who has access to the internet can pick up a task. And importantly, this world of work, the people who are supplying the labor supply in this platform economy, it's, it's not just one person. What's being supplied is an abundance of people. So the innovation here, again, about 15 years ago, was that businesses could use websites, the internet, and this, this mix of different software to find other workers, to find workers who would be willing to sign up for an account and make themselves readily available to pick up a task that was not directly assigned to them. And this means that anything that could be sourced, scheduled, managed, shipped, and build, at least in part, is a part of this world, this on-demand world of work that is served up through platforms. Companies in almost all cases are the platform. That's why I think it's funny to call it platform economies. It's really companies doing business on the web, this mix of software and the internet effectively offering people, but also alighting the truth of the matter, which is it's their 
their collective contributions that are the real value of this enterprise, of this, this economy. Now, for most people, you're not familiar with the businesses that we were studying, but you might recognize a few that are called a little more visibly using the same mechanism. This online to offline platform service world of ride hailing services, of food delivery services, of design services, these are all using the same mechanism of what's for computer scientists called human computation, but is effectively the platformatization of labor, of service work particularly. And hovering right at the tip of this iceberg is a world of work that two years ago, three years ago, when I would say content moderation is a job, most people would not be able to fully understand that a person could be involved in reviewing and moderating online content. But now I think we're becoming aware that these are people around the globe in many cases who are tasked with looking at the information that we as users of social media produce every day that maybe we flag as um, hateful, and then a group of people are assigned the job of looking at what we've flagged to figure out if it should be removed or not. That is a form of this labor too. Below the surface is a world of startups and large companies like Accenture that are providing the labor supply for millions of tasks happening every second. <laughs> It's, it's an incredibly busy world of work. Most of it, if not the majority of it, um, is done on contract. It's done in seconds. It's, it, and it's not yet organized in the way that we would readily recognize as work. So in thinking about this world of work, um, one of the key arguments in the book is that we're witnessing this paradox of automation's last mile. Robots aren't around the corner. It's more that as technologies automate some work, particularly service work, it's creating this new type of work that's deeply dependent on human expertise. So before COVID-19, we were looking at a good 5% of the US population having experimented with some form of just this online gig work. This is not including people who were driving for ride hailing apps or using any of the services that are more familiar to you. This was strictly people using those, those services to find work that I had below the water. Now, by some estimations, if you think about the world working remotely, we have a significant number of people doing remote work. That means they're able to pick up their work online that it, it is in least, at, at least in part sourced, scheduled, managed, shipped, and billed through this mix of the internet, web interfaces, and a person being available on the other side of a screen. I wouldn't want to um, conflate these two categories. They're, they're quite distinct, but the argument of the book is that there's not much, there's not much light between the world of information service work we were studying of people who are doing things like data labeling and content moderation and a host of other small tasks provided by, by a demanding, usually a large company like mine that needed to find people to do work. And this other world of work that many of us are familiar with of being able to find your work, be basically asynchronous with your coworkers and submit your work without ever having to particularly interact with anyone. The current market is about 25 billion for this world of, of on-demand online information service work. Plant-based food market is about 7 billion. <laughs> Mobile gaming apps is about the same as digital labor markets for uh, this on-demand task-based work. Just to give you a sense of, we really aren't paying attention to how quickly this has grown and how much bigger it could be. 
So what are the streams of work I'm talking about? I want to make this concrete because there really are two worlds that um, start off seemingly in the same place of trying to automate the kinds of tasks that a human might do today with the eye toward um, being able to have algorithmic systems take it over. Things like data labeling are effectively the data management of, of today. It's looking at large sets of data that might have typos, might have um, inconsistencies or outdated records and having a person do that update or at, at just simply attaching um, a, a word that'll, a keyword that'll describe a particular image. That's all necessary for any sort of computational process trying to learn to automate something. The other two categories I wanted to give you as an examples are content review. So again, content moderation and telehealth, having someone be able to look at information you might receive through a text. We've all been receiving texts probably about our um, need to get a COVID boost. Being able to make sure those messages are correct takes a certain amount of human labor to make sure that they're firing off correctly. But there's a second stream of work that's much more important to track. It's this human in a loop information service work. And the companies we studied were doing things like generating leads for sales teams, basically going through LinkedIn, looking for, well, who would you contact if you needed to sell a company air, you know, air conditioners or refrigerators? That's a task that used to be done by in-house salespeople or sales forces that you can turn over to companies that provide this, this labor force, this workforce to, to take up that task of find me the best person to contact if I'm selling these products. Translation and captioning a video is still incredibly difficult. Even if we have live captioning right now, anybody who's tried to use it for fidelity, like if you really depend on a transcript that's been done automatically, it's not great. So if you have a business need, there are plenty of companies that can provide this translation and captioning service. Video is particularly difficult. So it's one of those places it's very difficult to remove a person from the process. And then lastly, telehealth by contact tracing requires keeping somebody in the loop so that that text is actually a person who could then phone someone who confirms, yes, they have COVID and they need help. So this isn't entirely new work. And I feel like one of the most important things we can do is look to the continuity here. There's a world of peace work. And I want you to start noticing the faces you see in these pictures a world of human computation when computers were women and particularly women of color working on projects that were considered just rote mathematics. And the Kelly Girls is probably one of the best recognized, but certainly the beginning of a, of a tide of clerical workforces that were spun up in the 60s and 70s, the beginning of temp work as a way of structuring employment that was imagined to be temporary, because if you recall during this time period, the assumption was women were going to be getting married and moving on to their real next job. So by the time you get to the point of outsourcing in the early 2000s, there's already a well-established habit of firms imagining that there is a way in which the work that somebody does is not necessarily something that has to be done on site. Can we sort out who is perhaps built for the full-time assembly line or the noble profession and who could easily just do what we consider the throwaway work, the peace work. The rise of temp staffing and certainly the introduction of the internet enabled an entire supply chain around the globe of being able to, to cast off work that was considered less valuable, less difficult, less creative, and to send it around the world. The information economy, whatever we want to call this latest iteration of capital that's so dependent on data, data as a um, resource, but also as a futures market, also depends on many people managing this data to make it a little bit more structured, a little bit more useful. Um, you might call it data enrichment. 
And it's this constant churn of a need for specific talent to be around specific projects like prototyping or to have different language to localize a product that constantly refreshed the demand for different kinds of workers to come to the call for help. So to get at this world of work, which was not particularly easy, um, but it, after a little bit of time, it dawned on us, we needed to look at the work sites that are effectively the, the new shop floor for this environment. And that meant going to several different platform companies and uh, in some cases having their contributions to our efforts. They gave us the transactional data of their um, supply and demand of tasks and workers taking up those tasks. In other cases, we were running experiments, behavioral experiments on some of those platforms to understand how workers connected or disconnected. But we also were using traditional ethnographic and anthropological approaches by finding people who are doing this work and having their kindness, inviting us into their lives really inform the ways in which this work fits into the rest of their life. I want to give you one key finding to think about. And again, I know I'm throwing a lot at you to get to our discussion, but I wanted to give you one finding that I think was um, perhaps the most important uh, for me to take away, which is that there isn't one type of worker um, in this ecosystem, in these labor markets. And, and it's going to make quite a bit of sense in a moment as to why that would be. If you think about that, again, that platform is an open call. It calls many people to the possibility of work. Well, just like any social media um, experience we've probably ever had, or think about a Wikipedia, or even think about a book club, you end up with about 10% of people saying, I'm in, I'm going to turn this into what is the equivalent of the amount of money I would make full time or that I need to sustain myself. And they have their reasons, and I'm going to share some of those in a moment. But importantly, about 10% of the people who are participating in these labor markets who often work on multiple platforms, that is, they work for many companies or several companies, they are the always on who make this experience for the consumer seamless. It means that they will always be able to, a consumer will always be able to find a worker who knows what they're doing and can deliver. But just as importantly, there's this, what I call a deep bench of regulars, about 20% of the people who are participating in these markets. They pick a certain number of hours, they pick a day, they, they uh, pick a particular set of tasks and they are this, this um, constant refreshing well of people who are available, that abundance, that means when that 10% who cannot work 24 seven might step away anytime they can, those 20% of regulars are there to step in to the maw and a consumer can't tell the difference. They're not requesting a particular person, they are relying on the availability of of many capable people. And then lastly, and I thought this was probably the hardest part to accept, that in most economics, you learn that churn is a bad sign, that when you have a lot of turnover, it's certainly bad for workers, but it's also bad for the experience of um, any consumer. This is a completely different orientation to delivering to a consumer, whether that's a business or an, uh, a person who's using a service directly, that 70% are people trying out this world of work to see if it works for them. And they may do one or two or four tasks and they are still contributing value. They are still making it possible for you as the end consumer to see many people available all the time. Each of the platforms we studied had different ways of organizing their relationship to this fluctuation and, um, and really the distribution. It was a fairly constant thing to find this distribution on the platforms. But the important thing to see in this is that there isn't the possibility of a policy that can identify the needs of that 10% and serve 
the other work needs, the other labor needs of the 70%. We tend to come at this problem as though everybody needs to be full time or everybody needs to be formally employed. And in fact, the orientation to an open market like this makes it an, an intractably difficult problem to stabilize how many hours people have or how many, how, what their participation looks like, precisely because people are drawn to this work or find themselves in this work because formal employment structured as shift work or structured in ways that require that, uh, the person to, to adhere to somebody else's schedule don't work. And that's incredibly gendered. So let me talk a little bit about the mental maps of, of the people who are participating here. When you ask them how they describe their work, their sense of um, how they're making sense of what they're doing is everything from working for a startup or being their own boss to being a freelancer who is creating a job opportunity by subcontracting the tasks they've collected. What I find fascinating about uh, the moment during reviewing my field notes, when I saw these, these three statements, they all worked for the same platform and they all did very similar sorts of tasks. So they have vastly different senses of what they're doing. And that might have a lot to do with why they're doing it. There, there's nothing flexible about this work. It's, it's not about um, being able to work anytime you want, because in many ways, people have to be hyper vigilant, constantly looking for work opportunities. But what, what people were looking for and what's felt like the common denominator from the field work was that they all needed, if not wanted, to control their time. They had schedules, often demands on their time that were about care work for others. They were caring for children, elders. They had other goals, they had other interests, but they needed to control their time. They also often wanted to control the projects they work on. And I think we can all relate to that. Um, I do just about anything to be able to set my own agenda for what work I do. The same holds true for the individuals who are participating in these labor markets. They're looking for chances to test out what is it that I love to do? What is it that I'm good at? And what are ways in which I can make money on something I'm able to do that doesn't drain me? Like all of those were statements we heard. And then lastly, and I think this is, um, again, like the other two um, items, a reflection on what's dysfunctional about our formal employment um, settings and, and markets. People express this need to control their work environment. They wanted to control the um, opportunity to be present as themselves, to not have to commute, to feel that they didn't have to conform to somebody's expectations of what it meant to be in the workplace. That included women who were trying to get out of environments that would pose sexual harassment, that included trans and non-binary people who were tired of being misgendered all the time, and myriad other groups of people that just felt that the formal workplace expected norms that did not fit them. I want to um, move towards ending this conversation with a quote from Carmela, who was one of the workers that we stayed with through the 19 months. And I thought what was so telling about her sharing with us that she can make money anywhere, um, that she's working on the things that matter to her and all she needs is to take a computer with her, that she was living her ideal life. The argument here isn't that platform work is her ideal life. It's that the ability to organize her work life around her own life and own interests was the most important thing to her. And that she had the opportunity through this work, particularly for the platform that she worked with, that she worked on, to be able to have this work support her other interests. Her work in choreography particularly was with kids and she knew that she would burn out if she was trying to make that a full-time um, form of income and she could balance out being able to have the money she needed to support the choreography work that she did by doing this type of work. So where do we go from here? 
Because I feel like the key takeaway that I want to put on the table for discussion is that the challenge around organizing to be able to have regulations that are meaningful to the workers in this, this labor market really depends on recognizing why our old forms of labor organizing will not work. There's no single work site. There's no sole employer of record. There's no unifying professional identity or career. There's a globally networked, often independent workforce that's working behind the scenes. And there's really a sense of collective rather than individual achievement that is driving the development and arguably the value of these platforms. And let me dwell on that point for a second that in most cases, if you think about our worlds of work, they hinge on imagining we can delineate between what I've done as a worker and what my coworker next to me has done. That there's some way we can quantifiably in some hard or soft way, tell the difference between the quality of our work. And therefore you can set everything from a career ladder to, um, to salaries on that distinction. In this world, there's value in someone getting it wrong. I, I like to give the example of data labeling. Often what you're doing is having many people look at the same material, offer a label, and then you're taking, taking what's called a weighted value. You're literally through the, the speed of an algorithmic process able to capture, did 10 people use the same word, that must be the word we should use to describe this image. You can have one person who's given a label that's completely off, you know, makes no sense. That person's providing value. They, they create a loud signal that the other 10 are right. So there's even value in submitting something that's the opposite of what you decide to take away as the right label. And the other image I want to leave you with is thinking about a ride hailing app. If you had to choose between two and you opened up one of the apps and it showed you 20 you know, ride drivers, 20 cars just humming around your neighborhood available in five minutes, you'd probably choose that over the app that gives you five cars that might show up in 20. The only reason you can have the experience of saturation, of complete abundance as a consumer and be able to have a car pick you up whenever you need it is precisely because the business model is people being available to you. But the problem is we have no laws governing the availability of people doing this form of work. So that availability is something that has been put on the shoulders of the work, of the workers. They carry the costs and the risks of being available, of being abundant rather than the consumers or this market that's benefiting from this abundance of people available, not on a shift, but across a full range of time. I'll leave you with this picture of the Boston Common. It's not that far from my home. And thinking about you know, what would it mean to change our approach to thinking of employment, not as something possessively held by one firm that's competing with another firm to possess and invest in individuals, but rather we imagined this world of work as a place that is constantly tending a commons of people available who always have the capacity to contribute. And in fact, we need all of them to be available to make the contributions available at any moment. But that means that we have to put in to tend that commons before we ever take out. There isn't a form of this work that can really sustain itself if we're not all contributing to assuming that I'm not paying for the person who's available to me now, I'm paying for the possibility of people caring for me later. And that's particularly important if we're talking about health work. So with that, I wanna thank the many people who went into um, making this work possible. And also um, please feel free to check out the website for the book. It's got lots of resources for people. And then lastly, I wanna thank the folks who invited me to, to speak with you today. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was, 
really struck by a couple of things and I have questions that I will start with while people are getting themselves um, together to write their questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, first of all, one of the things that struck me, and it's something that I mentioned to you earlier, was that, um, so like there is this way in which these small tasks, this small task focus, in my mind, harkens back to a sort of Adam Smith production process of the pins, right? But of course we're not in a factory. And of course, as I said, you know, like the migration of ideas and practices don't result in any perfect analogy, but th there's that element of control that I see. And I'm wondering if you could talk really briefly or talk a little bit about distinctions and similarities or differences and, and similarities from my Adam Smith economic <laughs> and, <laughs> no, I, factory production, all of that. No, I, I mean, I love the analogy because I think in many ways, the early applications of technology were precisely about having some mechanized process mm -hmm. be able to model itself after a human mechanized process, a physical process, and move with the same ease as a person. So if you think mm -hmm. about it, the assumption there is that the thing that's modeled is the, the physical movement. You know, how would you assemble a pen? And so much of that manufacturing, it, it went that direction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So much of manufacturing, most of the effort was like, we're just thinking about how do we use Taylorism? How do we think about the increment of each motion? and the time motion approach to building out systems that could initially help you know, the factory worker be able to assemble pins more quickly and then ultimately replace the worker so that, the, that a machine could assemble the pins. The biggest difference here, it is an assembly line, sorry, I just hit my, my space bar. Um, it is an assembly line of some kind, but the difference is that it's not linear. The, the, the assemblage of the, um, the product is really the aggregation of all of these people's cognitive, creative, snap human judgments. So it turns out the thing that that, um, I mean, I love this because the, the thing about artificial intelligence that I learned uh, early on was it's really great at anything that has a very clear, do this, not that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. fantastic for that. That's why it's, it's a really great approach to automation of mechanical effort because it's, very, it's, it's, re it's repeated, it's rote, it's predictable. Right. The biggest difference here is this, this approach to work and particularly information work is that I'm folding in a person at the moment where there is no mechanism for this or that because it's a deliberation. I have to choose, do you think the sky is beautiful or mysterious? Mm. There's no right answer, right? And so if you're, whether it's I'm trying to write, um, and this, you know, the, the number of tasks are, are pretty profound. So if it is, I'm trying to decide in a moment, if your, uh, um, your picture matches a picture on file, and I'm looking at, uh, this is one of the examples we have in the book, and I'm, I'm I, I, you know, the, there isn't a good match between that picture that's on file and person who's just snapped their picture to confirm. And that's a security, uh, a use of security that's, that's widespread now. Mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. the easiest thing to do is give it to a person. A person in a heartbeat can look at a picture and look at you know, one picture and another and, and fairly quickly tell you is, is something, um, do they match? I think the other great example is content moderation. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to tell when is somebody saying, I fucking hate you as an, as an expression of love. You, you, you just can't tell, it's sarcastic, is it? What is that? So, so that's a long-winded way of saying the biggest difference here is that the, the work that is automated are all mm -hmm. of the pieces that can actually be done without a person. 
And then there's this piece that's left that's creative. We've literally like boxed ourselves in a corner of what's left of work. It's all of the sensorial, it's all of the um, emotional work that goes into care. That's why I think if we characterize this as service work, it makes so much sense it'll be so hard to automate. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so thinking, so it is, so this service work, I'm gonna ask maybe two more questions and I'm gonna get to the audience. So this service work is representative of a sort of higher order of service, of the service industry, which has traditionally been haunted by low wages, no protections, no long-term commitments. And so that, so there are two parts to this, which is that seemingly precludes organizing for rights, worker rights, um, in which there's really a sort of high order, you said it's not flexible, but it does feel flexible, or maybe at least contingent, a sort of high order contingency work environment. So in other words, what kind of organizing can people be engaged in? And then the other part of this is you, what you said was that people um, want to control their time, right? Don't people want to yeah. control their time and have security? <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't have the choice, right? It's like you need security first. Right. Fundamentally. And I know you're asking the most important question in my mind, because one of the biggest challenges here is this is not a market problem. The low <laughs> wages are not a result of not being able to price this labor. They are the result mm -hmm. of power. Right. You know, and I think that is the toughest thing is that the erosion, I mean, that the, the, um, the allowance of low wages in service work are, are, are not a bug, they're a mm -hmm. feature. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, they're, they're, particularly in the US context, we didn't have labor organizing in the service sector early and hard enough. Now think back to that picture I showed you about when did we start seeing service work, particularly clerical work as information service work. It's, it's mm -hmm. mostly young women. And no, they were not seen as a, as a force to organize. They were seen as a force to push out for, um, for some of the more traditional labor. And I, I'd be the first to say, like it's not that organized labor wasn't trying to think about how to organize peace workers. They were, mm -hmm. they were going to family farm, farms and saying, you know, please see the collective, um, you know, the, the shared, uh, the common cause we have here. It's a very tough sell if you don't have a way to make a case that you can provide the kinds of security that are a little bit more practical um, or possible when you can get everybody to collectively strike. So thinking about the early tactics for labor organizing, which have become the go-to tactics for mm -hmm. organizing are very difficult to, um, to operationalize in a setting where people don't share that profession. They don't share a single work site where you can make sure everybody is striking, where you do feel a sense of common cause. So we have this, this this really the collision of, of, of the histories of letting certain wage workers um, be left to fend for themselves, mm -hmm. assuming that, um, you know, service work was less valuable than the manly work of the factor, factory floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I hope somebody's probably going to give me a really hard time about that, but I'll, I'll just say that. And then also the realities of how long we've been dismantling em employment and right. using outsourcing particularly. So this is really the, um, the violence and the colonialist legacy of labor arbitrage coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. This isn't anything we haven't done everywhere else in the world, this extractive um, predatory inclusion, right, <laughs> of a kind that assumes whomever's available 
to serve someone can't be that valuable. But then this is, I, for me, the, the thing that I, in, in the book, the conclusion of the book is a set of recommendations for what do we do to fight this? We would right. all need to see it should not matter where you work. Uh, everybody needs healthcare. Everybody needs continuing education. Everybody needs childcare. Everybody needs paid leave to contribute economically. You yeah. shouldn't have to find a good employer to have those fundamental needs met, to have security, to participate mm -hmm. in the market. Now, usually the trade-off was, okay, we're, we're not agreeing, we're cost sharing that as a society. That's stupid, but fine, that's, what we're, that's where we're at. But the assumption was each firm that really deserves it will be able to survive and, and they'll set a standard. We don't have that anymore either. Mm -hmm. So it's so, it, it, we're, we're at the point where the best strategy would be for all of us to see, we have common cause to make the case that every worker deserves a set of benefits, no matter when they're stepping into the labor market. And that's a, that's a demand that will require um, both organized labor yeah. and consumers and citizens saying, this is what everyone deserves. That's, that's I, if we hadn't had a pandemic, I actually would have thought we were further away from that. I think more people now can appreciate why we are all better served by at least healthcare being available to everybody, because it turns out no one is served by that being a, you know, a benefit that, that only a few have. And then the last thought on this is like, it's not hard to think about a lawyer um, or a concierge doctor who are on retainer. Well, mm -hmm. culturally we value their service. That is the only difference. It's not the market has figured out that value as that culture has placed a value on it. So why would it be any different for home health care, for a home health care aid? We can, we can you know, argue about how much salary or wages, but wages are not the issue when it comes to security. It's, it's all of the other, the, the suite of benefits that make it possible to feel like you can have other choices. We, we don't provide that. Right. But so that opens up some of that points to some of the questions that people in the chat have. So Rafi asks the question about what about benefits that you would normally receive for full time work, like as, such as health care? And then um, some of what you were saying also leads me to want to ask you to respond to Milton's question, which is, how do these new work paradigms affect those with and without college degrees? Right, right. No, actually, let me take the first question and, or the second question and then come back to the, the first question. So I might need you to remind me <laughs> that yeah. the thing about college degrees, I think what was um, quite um, not surprising, that there was one, one common thread. Most people had college degrees among the people who were doing task-based work that we were studying. Okay. The majority do, particularly we were comparing India and the United States. And in India, if you think about it, there's some things that make sense here. You have to have internet access. You have to have some media literacy. You have to have some linguistic fluency. All of those things set up who would likely be able to engage in this work. But that's a significant amount of the global population can have those things. I mean, that the, the existence of mobile phones have really expanded people's access to the kind of education we're talking about. So education mattered because most of the folks who were able to sustain themselves making a living, and for them, living is relative, like how much money people are making, but allowed them to sustain themselves, they relied on a liberal arts education because that education is what taught them um, how to learn what to learn. The most successful freelancers, and it's really that environment, are the ones mm -hmm. who are not deeply um, knowledgeable about a specific subject, but know how to move across domains and figure out what, what don't I know enough of and where do I need to ask for help? So in some ways, it was the cultural capital of being comfortable asking for help 
that was probably mm -hmm. the most valuable piece of their education. But the, the other really interesting thing about education was many of the people who are involved in these markets, they're involved in platforms that came to be around 2006, seven ish. They were the ones who um, really um, expanded this labor market during the great recession. They were the people who were first generation college goers. You know, the folks who were the always on regulars, they didn't have the social capital to be able to mm -hmm. land a more stable opportunity. So what does this say about education? It should remind us that education really is not well spent as a tool for teaching somebody what job to take. It's a tool for teaching people how to continue to teach themselves how to be in the world and how to communicate with others. The most valuable thing education could do for us right now. And it's not to say uh, higher education is more valuable than ever because it teaches us how to relate to each other across boundaries. It's, that is the most important thing everybody could be learning in a, global, uh, a globally networked labor market, let alone a globally networked world, is how do you interact with people who are not like you? So that's what I would say about education, is this is actually an, an argument, the orientation of this market, this paradigm. That's why I wanted to take the, the second question first. The paradigm here is an orientation to work that says it's project by project. And that, that could, and I'm actually, some days I'm actually quite hopeful that what this means is that we could no longer insist that you're supposed to know exactly what you want to be doing and therefore you've earned the right to a full-time job and the, ben the benefits that come with it. Benefits right now are attached to full-time work. Again, not because the, the market said so, but because we allowed markets to set that standard. That's, mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be true. It, we can attach it to citizens' rights or residents' rights to be able to have mm -hmm. access to those things. And when I say that, it's with the awareness that most working adults are working. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's to, to attach it to people who are living in the world, uh, to attach those benefits and say, they're not perks. They are basics. They are basic benefits that facilitate us contributing to our, to our communities. And that includes economically contributing to our communities. So mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we don't benefit by turning something necessary into a perk. So... Um... So one thing that I'd want to say before I get back to the other questions are this is this does seem to be really if we assume that it could have the positive um, benefits and attributes that you just laid out is that this is a good case for liberal arts education, which is really supposed to be teaching you about flexibility. Yes, <laughs> the fact that you're going to have ten to fifteen different jobs in your work time work career, but. Yes. On the other hand, not everybody has access to education. And we do know that labor practices have historically uh, marginalized Black, Indigenous, Latinx, people of color, women, and LGBTQI plus people. So how does this, or does this um, online, I'm sorry, online demand for task laborers mediate these historically constituted racial, gendered, and sexual identity inaccessibility in labor markets? Does it do that? I'm not convinced that it would or does. I'm not convinced it, it can in, in some, again, in some unregulated world. What I did see, what, what we did see in our research were people who were um, fleeing formal employment or never had access to it. So if I compare right. India and the United States, there were many women, um, certainly different castes and different um, cultural groups that were moving to this work precisely because it didn't have the barrier to entry that other forms of work did. And that was true in both the United States and in India, but it was more pronounced in India around gender and, and around, um, around religious identity. So seeing ways in which the marginaliz marginalization that persists in formal employment um, something that we've not been able to get 
rid of, and nor do I imagine we could, because it's, it's a reflection of the, the systemic inequities and violence that structures our everyday world, a way of interrupting it that we saw were people saying, okay, what are my options? And I think the thing that was again, striking about studying India is that most of the world does not participate in formal employment. Most of the world is managing economic activity very relationally, very much through service to each other. And so just in the same way, I mean, I think to your point, the thing that I found both chilling and galvanizing was that people tended their boundaries. People became very protective of the groups they formed. And that included groups of people of color, that included people with different disabilities, that included a range of folks, particularly in India. And sometimes they would cross those boundaries and other times they would fiercely keep others out. So ironically, at least the, you know, this ideal, idealizing of a business environment where we um, incent diversity and inclusion, we're far from that. But at least the language and a particular um, value proposition of that has been put in place in formal employment. There's nothing like that in, in this other world. It would really, to me, completely hinge on that liberal arts education you're talking about that says, okay, what is important here? In the same way that we thought arithmetic becomes important or spelling becomes important to the everyday worker because of a particular business need, we have deep business need for people to be able to collaborate within a matter of moments. In some cases, we had groups that were coming together as teams to work on a task that's bigger than data labeling, but was still going to be two hours. And people literally had to organize around a particular process and say, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this. And half the people had never met each other and would not see each other again reliably. So arguably, the most important thing we could do with a liberal arts education is to say it is our capacity to be able to work with and through differences, that is going to be the most valuable thing that people could take away from their education. And mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we don't see that. We, we're still treating it as some like nice thing to do. <laughs> Even that, it's not clear to me the investment's there. So I'm not convinced that this will um, intrinsically produce that, uh, that kind of, of um, of cross-cultural recognition or connection. It will be have, it'll have to be produced, but it's actually pretty demonstrably the most important resource that people use to be able to succeed in these markets. And that they mentor each other constantly. They're always telling each other like, well, this is how you get through it. So mm -hmm. that's, that is an asset. That's also an asset for organizing. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> some other... <laughs> <laughs> well like what i'm thinking yeah. is like people can't even afford to go to college like you can't afford to go to a slat you know I, so anyway I, yeah. i'm gonna let that go for a moment i'm gonna get back yeah. to other people's questions we can continue yeah. this later. so well laura says it sounds like it would be a race to the bottom if anyone with a good internet connection and computer all over the world can do this work <laughs> and i would say again that that is true if we let the market um, dictate work conditions. Right. And we know that anytime we let the market dictate work conditions, that's exactly what happens. That's why it's so necessary for us to say, this is a world of work. What work conditions do we want for each other? And that we should be able to see each other. I think of adjuncting all the time and tutoring. Yeah. And the, you know, this is not far from the worlds we're in right now. So yeah. what do we want that world to look like? And, and I, I, I think the argument that it's a race to the bottom is to let go of the critique that I think we all need to have that you shouldn't be able to escape having to provide good work conditions just because you found a, a set of workers on the other side of the planet nobody can see. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's just not defensible, but we've made it defensible. Right. So Mary says, this, I'm just reading what it says. Oh, this oh. feels 
like this you're talking about Mary. no not you mary this mary mary mccrory okay. this feels like the tech revolution has erased 100 years of labor ascendancy and leverage to improve working conditions and wage be and benefits to return to a sweatshop piece work model which is another uh person made uh, a comparison to for example five cents a button sewn onto a dress is the pay and similar. So you pay, so your pay is dependent upon how many buttons you can sew on a work day. So is there any way to have a capitalist system that doesn't constantly devote itself to paying as little as possible for the labor upon which their obscene profits are based? If not, what can we do? This is not acceptable in any belief system that work has high value and needs to be paid for accordingly. That's what Mary says. No, and I couldn't agree more. And I think the hardest thing is none of us are outside of capital. So right now we are all benefiting from human labor we cannot see and did not pay for. And that is our fault too. It's not just companies doing it because of the organization of this form of work. Consumers are benefiting from the negligence that's passed on to us. So for me, the answer, and I, I guess I'm a bit of a pragmatist this way, like I, I, I do believe there are some forms of cooperative approaches to capitalism that could be incredibly profoundly useful here. And yeah. I, I wanna use it as a chance to talk about this work I'm doing in North Carolina, because you know when I finished this work, it felt like one of the most important places to think about last mile delivery and it, delivery of, of information is in healthcare. Telehealth and last mile deliver, delivery of health. Being able to organize people to quickly route to the place where help is needed because they are closest to it, but they don't, that's not their route. That could be incredibly important. Like you don't want somebody who doesn't speak somebody's language to be the person who responds to an emergency call just because that's a person who's on shift. So this mm -hmm. is a way of being able to provide the labor necessary to support a range of health needs that are culturally connected. To me, the most important thing we can do is to make sure the power of leveraging both the labor conditions, the pricing, and the security are in the hands of communities providing that health care. Right now, that business is entirely um, gate, it's gate kept by hospitals and, and systems that absolutely profit by subcontracting out to mostly women, women of color, undocumented workers. And mm -hmm. we have so many people who are going to be aging in place in just this country who desperately need a, a form of care that is available to them effectively 24 seven that, that it actually can meet their needs. A really effective way to meet their needs would be to be able to have that B platform work, but it will all fall apart if we're not paying our fair share for that work. That means all of us paying for our fair share. So what does that cost sharing look like? To me, that's the, the crux of the question because our mm -hmm. old models assume that the employer is who should pay for the workers' needs and benefits. I do not believe that model makes any sense in a world where the consumer, because of this coordination of um, supply, is quickly consuming the labor of someone who's been routed to fill their need. So the, the business is certainly profiting, the firm mm -hmm. is profiting, mm -hmm. it's the consumer who's getting a lion's share of profit. So they should pay the lion's share of costs. So it will require consumers saying, what should I be paying? But the, I think the best thing is if we had sectoral bargaining around mm -hmm. the use of these platforms and you mm -hmm. had incentives to say, you know what? A co-op of healthcare workers who can coordinate themselves because they do that anyway already, thank you very much. They give each other rides, they give each other childcare. They're basically carrying all the costs of the firm. So let them fully gain back the, the rights to their, you know, the profits of their labor. Mm -hmm. That model is capitalism. 
that's that's you know if you're laboring and you get paid for your labor we there's no other way to talk about it <laughs> and i i would be fine if we if somebody could come up with a different system what i'm most interested in is making sure that people who are doing work in care of others are both compensated fairly but also that they're not left to make the case that they should be because there's no person contributing to these moments of care who um, isn't clearly valuable because they're available. Mm -hmm. I don't need to wait for them to care to provide that, that sustenance, that, that security, like you said, Donna. And that's the piece we're missing. We really say the argument we have in the book, it's, it's a retainer. So you could get all of the firms in a sector to basically be paying for a base wage that everybody gets. And it's not pity money. It's, I need you. I just don't know when. So somebody asked the question, like, how does this, how does this particular um, labor market structure at, encourage or deal with issues of advancement? Like, you know, like, where do you go? Right, right. No, I think that's one of the most interesting questions because I don't know that we can hold on to the idea of advancement in the way that we have in the past. Our ideas of advancement are built on a model of I'm a novice and I accrue knowledge about deeply about a particular area and then I move up the ranks. Well, A, that doesn't happen because of merit. So we have to let go of this myth of meritocracy that somehow I advance because I gain so much wisdom and credibility and therefore I'm given control. That is not who gets control. <laughs> See Jeff Bezos or <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg for evidence. So, you know, there's, that's part of it. But I think the other part is what is it that we're trying, what need are we trying to meet when we talk about advancement? We're usually talking about recognition. We're talking about being able to really feel valued for what we do. And I think what's fascinating to me is that within networks of, of freelancers or independent contractors and for the networks we were studying, for them, that form of advancement is being a mentor. They were uncompensated, that, that is what's bothersome. But for many of us, the idea of being compensated for our mentorship, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit charged, it's a bit complicated because it's also something that, that gives us a, I don't know, a sense of joy. You know, I wouldn't want somebody paying me and Donna go there because I think you need to push back on me. It's like, nobody should be doing the uncompensated care work, right? Like, right. but it's that it's uncompensated. Um, yeah, and also, but also, I'm I'm also really interested in the ways that yeah. people want to engage in advancement for for you know instrumentalist reasons. Like, I need more money because I want to do A, B, and C, and I want to be able to yeah. send my kid, or I want to do this or that. Yeah. And so there's this um, tension between the altruism and the the whatever it is i mean you're based what you're saying yeah. to me is that you're talking about like a full-on restructuring of society our norms our yeah. our values that are going to be implemented not because people said oh i want to work and you know love my job and and i like mobility but because of a damn pandemic in, in many ways right yeah that yeah. forced this on but i just don't know that I just have, I have mixed feelings about who the beneficiaries of this kind of consulting yeah. labor force will be. And then- No, 100%. So. No, no, no. I mean, this is, you know, any enthusiasm you hear is me desperately wanting to, <laughs> to do something with the reality that I saw that isn't just not going away. Because when I started this work, I'm like, oh, this is like only going to be around for a little while, right? Like, oh my God, no. This, this is precisely where all the energy around um, technologies are going is to augment what people are doing. Well, that means that in many ways, I can just, I can break apart the, the large task and turn it into many different tasks so that you can choose 
to pay somebody else to manage your calendar? And is that, you know, what to do with that? To me, the thing to do with that is like, okay, then let's value each other for that. Like, what would that look like? And yeah. you're right, I'm calling it for- It would look like anti-racism. Yes, <laughs> it absolutely. Would look like, and I just, and like this person, Rami Smith says, you know, discuss the ways in which um, Massage Noir in the, in the cause, in the case, the ways in which Massage Noir ex exists in the case of ghost work. And I'm thinking about, you know, stripping away all of the barriers and the racism and the, you know, anti-Black racism, et cetera, and the settler colonialism, which still exists, right? Where, like how, I mean, I, I, I want to be hopeful and I think people need to be organizing and I absolutely think we need to have, you know, these diasporic, um, you know, sort of global relations that allow us to think collectively and creatively about how to re, how to tear down the structures that oppress us. And at the same time, I just, I, I just wonder how devalue, how being devalued historically um, mm -hmm. isn't going to rear its head in this environment. Let me go back to the, well, let me get concrete. So one of the platforms we studied was one of, it was for captioning and, and translation work, particularly for video. And they started out as this all volunteer, like got like hundreds of thousands of people who were doing this for, for TED, for the like TED talks mm -hmm. and, and people who really wanted to have material in their own language were like, I'll, I'll do this. And they basically built this amazing set of software tools for doing captioning and translation by breaking apart everything and, and distributing it to a team that did team mm -hmm. translation. Mm -hmm. And then companies started coming to them and saying, I have a project that really needs to be translated quickly. Can I pay you? And all of a sudden they had the possibility of going to their volunteers and saying, would folks like to be paid? You can choose which projects you wanna do. And people said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try that. And I think it's an interesting experiment. Again, it's an experiment in what could this look like? And in that case, what's fantastic, and I'm speaking, I know we're running along, but I wanted to say like, what's possible here is that the anti-racism that allows to go unchecked the uh, expansion of disparity in pay and work conditions, mm -hmm. this is a place where there can no longer be the excuse, well, that person's working harder, or that person has more education, or that person does this or that. Because in this case, everybody is literally paid the same because they are all doing the same work. And the value of what they're doing is really their collective, con it is their, con their contribution in aggregate. It's socialism, but it's capitalism. It's social capitalism. Social I mean, capitalism. You know, it, it is, and, but the, the beauty is that the agreement about why are we all being paid the same, there's yeah. no debate. There's no debate mm -hmm. because they can also agree who should be paid more. More, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they can all flip into that role. So you yeah. talk about advancement. It's like, there are folks who decide I'm gonna manage this, this, of, you know, this particular project. Mm -hmm. I did it one month. I don't wanna do it this month. You do it now. And everybody can step into that role. Mm, interesting. And that's equity. That's equity to me. Okay. Well. <laughs> no, oh, no, I love no. you so much. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to continue this conversation. Um, but yeah. right now, um, we are at time. And I am so grateful and thankful that you joined me in this conversation shared this really um, provocative and interesting and exciting work <laughs> with all of the people that attended. Um, it's really been wonderful. It's wonderful so, to see you. Wonderful to see you too. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for the great questions too. They yeah, are they're all the questions people should be push, push, push. It's good. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we're going to end this evening. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye.